What I want to know uh, from you, John, um, is what was the original impetus for this? Because you like football, but you're not a footballer. But how did you get inside the heads of these characters? Um, I think the way that any kind of story comes together is, is a kind of... Uh, several things kind of coalesce at once. There's a sense in which any answer to this question is a lie, but I'll try and tell a decent lie. Um, uh, one of the, the important things that really sort of struck me, there's a picture of the Manchester United FA Youth Cup winning team from 1992, uh, which I think is quite well known now, but when the picture was taken, it had an unusually high number of players who go on to play at the top level. Normally with youth teams, you might get one or two players who make it through to the um, first team of that club. And it had, uh, if I remember right, Beckham, Scholes, um, Phil Neville, several other players who went on to play at a very high level. And then um, beyond that, there were players who kind of played for sort of lower league clubs, who still very high standard of football, but not the top level. And then there, there are other players who drop out of the game. And I was interested in what it must be like to be stood next to David Beckham when you're 16. You've always been the best at school, best in your area. And suddenly, for whatever reason, you, you're not quite as quick as you were. You sort of you, you lose focus for a year, or whatever. That you're you're not you're out of that world. And then you watch someone else become very famous. And I wondered, first of all, what that life must be like. And then this, the flip side of that was wondering if, as well as perhaps being trapped by this the thing that you didn't achieve, I wondered if you could be the player who did make it and then feel trapped by that. Because I think you know, top level players, they're kind of they're on that path from the age of seven, usually, that kind of age, seven or eight. And most of us have no idea what we're doing in life until much, much later than that. So the idea that you could kind of, you, your destiny is chosen for you because you're good at something. And it may be that temperamentally that's not what you want to do. That, that was probably one of the key starting points. But your destiny was changed by having your play at the Royal Court. Um, so this play that Russell was, was cast in, and, and Lisa too, yep. Um, can you tell us what that was like? Um, because it's, I mean, it's, it's an accolade for anyone to be at the Royal Court, anyone near the Royal Court. Um, yeah. And the, the whole, because it sold out incredibly quickly and was a bit of a, a succès de scandale, would you say? <laughs> it, it's Succé a beautiful... de steam. Oh, yeah, succès de steam. Perhaps. Either of those are fine. Um, the, it was, it's, a, it's an amazing theatre, the Royal Court. It's got an amazing history of bringing through, through new writers, and it's many writers' favourite theatre, and have quite an emotional attachment to it. So, yeah, it's, it was terrific having um, the show on there. The, the, the play was on at the Royal Court upstairs, which holds about 85, 90 people. Um, and so it's very, very kind of small and focused and sort of... And how long was the run? Uh, seven week run, seven week run. So we've got about half the number of people here who saw yeah, the on one, Yeah, on, on one night. Yep. So it, it was an amazing thing having it on there, being part of the history of that theatre. And it's, you know, again, so, nice being part of the history of something else tonight. So Duncan, you were one of the people who got a ticket to that, to that play, is that right? <clears throat> it was sold out, but Russell used to live in my building and I asked him if he could get me in to see it. So that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. It's all down to Soho Lofts. <clears throat> Giving your address away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so you went, you went to the show. Um, what happened inside your head? Well, a couple of things. I, I thought it was amazingly well written and performed. It was very, very appealing. I thought the story really connected with me. But also, I had the opportunity to study the audience because, as John says, it was half of the audience on one side and half on the other. And before it started, there was such a buzz. And I, I, I thought, who were these people who were so excited about, about seeing this play? And I worked out that it was two-thirds women, which was quite surprising to me, a film of a play about gay footballers. And, um, but it was a very, very emotional experience. And so I thought, hmm, women and gay men... Um, that's a very identifiable demographic for a film. Um, and quite a big market. So quite a big market, actually, yeah. And um, I, you know, I wasn't seriously considering it at that point. And I thought about it afterwards, and I thought, hmm, I, I came up with in my head a new ending, which is this ending, and it's got a couple of changes. And I thought, hmm, you know, there's a way of I, I could see how you would turn it into a, 
a film without opening it up because that's the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction is to open up a play. So um, were you ever tempted to have scenes in no. football stadiums and no. the roar of the crowd? No, no, I think it's really, it, it is just being trapped in these th three rooms with these always with two or three people um, that, w that creates the impact of, uh, of this. It's a closed world. So, Ben, could you say something about the challenges of transferring, or maybe both of you, um, of transferring a stage play to a motion picture screen? Yeah, I mean, it was strange. The, the, the first thing you think is, oh, it, it can't feel like a play, so let's open it out. That was my first thought. But then there's such a simplicity to the three-scene structure that we actually sort of doubled down on that and took out... So there was a few like time jumps in the original play within scenes, and we got rid of those. So it's just three continual conversations. And so we, we actually went against what I think most people would do and, and made it more intensely um, claust claustrophobic. Um, there was a huge, you know, we spent pretty much the summer together adapting the play into a script, removing things from the play script that you didn't need and then putting stuff in that you needed from a film's point of view. And because you can get so close to them, and you're on their eye line, you're in their personal space in a way that you're not on stage, it meant that we could get rid of certain parts from the play, but um, that also meant that we needed other stuff as well. Um, so, it, I mean, the most important thing was getting the script right, and it took us a while, didn't it, John? Um, and so one was it a painful process for you, John, um, getting rid of words and scenes... Uh, no, no, I, I kind of like cutting things a lot. Um, it's, it's one of my favourite bits of the writing process. And I think, I mean, maybe I don't know if this is to do with sort of working in a sort of theatre or not, but you're, you're kind of quite used to kind of sort of tearing things out. But the way that sort of theatre works now, lots of directors will kind of work with you on the play. And so you, you kind of get used to, I guess, to sort of someone else's vision kind of working with yours a bit. So that it was never a problem. And... There was never a sense in which I wanted anything other than this to be a new thing and just sort of work on its own terms. So it, it felt a much more positive and exciting thing for me to kind of have the opportunity to change things. And did you write the play with any actors in mind or did the casting come after? I, I, wrote, I wrote the first draft of the play. Um, j just sort of, you know, just sort of wrote it. And then as I started working on the second draft of the play, I started imagining Russell doing it. Um, You're not alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that imagining or fantasizing? <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no more comedy tonight. <laughs> Do carry on. Uh, yes, to any of those. Uh, the, uh, I, I kind of, um, sometimes you hear an actor's voice when you're kind of, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're writing. It's, it's a really useful thing because you can kind of, so sort of think, well, they'll be good at this. You pick up a rhythm that might be, might be useful. And so Russell was part of the story of the past from the, the very, f we had a, a, a two day workshop on it when it was quite a rough play that Russell was sort of part of. Um, and so from that, you know, I was really excited. He, he wanted to do that initially, then very encouraged when he, he seemed to enjoy it, wanted to kind of carry on with it. So, Maybe we yeah. should hear from the actors. So Russell, would you like to tell us something about your, how you got involved? Um, was, it, was it an immediate love? Um, yeah. When you read the part? Yeah, totally. I, well, yeah, we did a two-day workshop at the Royal Court. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. By the way, this has been overwhelming. Um, yes, two-day workshop at the Royal Court, and then it sort of went quiet for about nine months or something. Then I heard that they were doing it, and I got onto my agent. I said, make sure that I'm in the mix for that, please. And they did, and I was, and then it all sort of came together. And then we did it for seven weeks and then suddenly we found out that Duncan was pitching it for a movie and here we are. So Lisa, could you tell us something of your experience? Yeah, um, I was in uh, Lanzarote, Lanzagrotti. <laughs> um, end of with, story. With, uh, the end, yeah. <laughs> with, um, <laughs> with my mum and uh, my agent called me and said... <laughs> I was with my mum, yeah, oh. and said, uh, there's this play at the Royal Court, I was always desperate to work at the Royal Court, and I needed to be there the next day, and I couldn't get there, unfortunately, so um, somebody else was cast in the role, 
um, which was, you know, just because I didn't get to audition for it. But unfortunately for her, she couldn't do it. And um, so then I suddenly had another opportunity to come and audition for it. Instantly loved it, John. It was really good. Yeah, it's really um, good. <laughs> it was really well done. And yeah, so um, I came in and met for it and was cast. So yeah, I feel very lucky to have been part of it. Actually, back to you, Russell. Could you tell us something about your relationship to your character? Because they're all, all four are incredibly intense characters. They've both got a kind of lovable side, and there's a, well, certainly with you, a bit of a darker side, too. Well, yeah, well, I think because you're seeing these, well, my character over 10 years, over a decade, you're seeing three stages of his life, and he starts off, and he's... He's like a little imp, and well, I, I did Lorraine Kelly today. She said I was like a little pony in the first scene, and uh, he's kind. They're on the precipice of what is going to be. They have the potential to fulfil in front of them, and it's all set out, and the dream is there. And as as the film goes on, you see, and as the play went on, you just see how chasing the dream and living as the public persona, how damaging that becomes to the human spirit and the things that we need in life, like love and intimacy and interaction and, and emotion, the real things that life's about. He's just pushed aside, and, but he, he craves it so much, but he's so proud and damaged, and that was just a gift. People say that a lot, but it was a gift as an actor that you have the ability to portray that. Uh, as a character, because you don't really get that sort of journey as much. So for me, as soon as I read it, I was like, mate, I've got to play this. And it's such a hot topic, and it's like the last taboo in British sport, uh, you know, and it just felt really, well, I just I wanted, I was desperate to do it. But for, for both of you, it's quite a physical portrayal, because you are ageing um, over 10 years, and I have to say, both of you look very fit um, at... <laughs> at Obviously, you've, 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 you, something's changed now that you're not the, in the 10 years. Could you tell us about, about what process you went through? I mean, was it gym training or, or something else? What was the, where was the magic? Well, I Arinze, found out you, can, you can speak about how you transformed yourself so <laughs> magically. I, I, <laughs> I didn't know anything about hits before, uh, before training for this. High intensity interval training. Um, and that is the reason, well, that's how we lost the weight, you know. Um, we shot it back to front. Can I say that? Can, yeah. Can I? Yeah, we, so, uh, so we, we were, I guess we were 29, and then we had two weeks to lose all the weight, and we just basically, we had this um, amazing yeah, fitness so. trainer, Daniel It was Osborne. over Christmas as well, and it was incredibly painful. <laughs> <laughs> it was over Christmas. And my mum was like, have a potato. I was like, I can't have a potato. Like, have a potato. Is this about a concentration camp? I was like, no, it's about... <laughs> no, mum. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I mean, I, I, well, yeah, mum, I've got an African, I'm actually Nigerian, like Ade, and Christmas is about eating, you know, and yeah. so it was really weird for me. It was hard well work, yeah. It was, it was tough, yeah. But did you actually enjoy the finished result? Can I just say, it was their decision to do it that way around, wasn't it? You, you said, are you sure you don't Yeah, because it, it was easy to go from whatever you're holding to then lose it rather than lose it and then build up again. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting to me, but yeah. Yeah, um, no, well, you know. Yeah. You sacrifice your Christmas for our film. <laughs> 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 well, I suppose, like Sure said, you can turn back time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I think... It... I was really struck by the absolute intensity of, of all your performances. Um, and could you just tell us something about how you, you make, you know, that you start, you can't start like screaming at the top. You've got to kind of, and maybe the director could come in and, and tell us how, uh, how that would do but, but you, you, Sorry, go on. No, no, no. Uh, you start with a great script and then you, uh, when you read John's text, it's obvious that there's highs and lows of energy, and in order to make that playable, we shot really long takes. Um, some of them were 13 minutes long, so these guys had a chance to really take a run at those intense moments, even two, um, two waves of intense moments, and it was, I hope, much easier to do it that way. To me, it felt like that would be 
the most playable and natural way to do it because it is so intense to jump in and out of that on shorter takes just wouldn't have been possible. No. It was a nightmare to plan the cameras to make sure that yeah. you, know, you weren't wasting film and things like that, but um, uh, that's how we did it. We just gave them time to naturally get there, which is why the aggression and the intensity, I think, feels quite real because they are actually at that level. They're not putting it on. They've got there. So, Lisa, did, did you feel that your performance in the theatre was very different to what you've, you've done on, on the film? Um, I don't think it was different. I mean, it was the same character at the end of the day, but um, it, it, was, it was a real luxury, wasn't it, coming in to do the film after having had a five-week rehearsal and then, Sorry. you know, seven weeks of performance. So to have that kind of you know, behind you before you even go in to, to film something is a real luxury. So I kind of feel like I really, well, we really knew the character, you know, when it came to, to filming it. So that was a, a real luxury that you don't often get with filming. So, yeah. So, Rinsley, did you feel that you had to run to catch up? Were you like Harry coming in when they'd already started? <laughs> no. I was nervous. I was, uh, I was scared, actually. But luckily, I mean, you know, Ben was... Well, he was also a newbie, you know, um, and, you know, he said to me, you know, every step of the way, you know, I got you. And, um, and not just that, but on, the, I guess, the first day of, well, when we sat down and read it, I just saw in everyone's eyes that they were like, OK, cool, here's a new kid and we are here to yeah, help. Because Arinze wasn't away. in the original play. No. So he came in to do the film and he, you had the toughest job because as me, Nico and Lisa, we already, as Lisa said, knew all the lines, knew these characters back to front and knew rocked up and you had to be like on point from the start. So you had the hardest job and I think it was just incredible what mm -hmm. Arinze has done on screen. Well, thank you. Couldn't Very have got there. I wish yeah. I could take the credit, but couldn't have got there without you guys. Right?